You've just bought a hard drive for your computer, and I'm sure you want to get it installed as soon as possible. I'm David Houghton, and I'm going to show you just how quick and easy the installation can be. First, I'll show you how to install and connect your hardware, and then I'll show you how to install the software that makes it all work. Now, I know some of you have 20 megabyte drives, some of you have 30 megabyte drives, and others of you have 40 megabyte drives. Instructions for installing the hardware are the same no matter what drive you bought, so everyone should watch the first part of this tape. But the software instructions that you need to watch will depend on the drive you've got. I'll tell you more about that later. I've put some titles at the bottom of the screen so you can identify specific sections of the tape. It says introduction now, but as I continue with the demonstration, the titles will change. This will be important when we get to the software installation, but it should also make it easier to find any other section if you need to rewind and review the tape. Here's how I'll take you through the installation. First, I'll show you what you should have received in the package with your hard drive. Then I'll show you how to remove the cover of your PC and give you a brief tour of the major components you'll find there. And finally, I'll show you how to install and connect your new hard drive and its disk controller card. That'll complete the hardware installation, but you've still got to install the software if you want your drive to work. The software instructions for the 20 and 30 megabyte drives are the same, but the 40 megabyte drive has its own set of software instructions. If you have the 20 or 30 megabyte drive, your software instructions will follow right after the hardware installation section and will be identified at the bottom of the screen. If you've got the 40 megabyte drive, complete the hardware installation and then just fast forward the tape until you see the title at the bottom of the screen change to 40 megabyte software. I'll remind you of this again later. Of course, if you have any questions, just call our technical department at 1-800-PCC-TECH. Let's get started. Check the package that you've received and make sure that everything's there. You should have the hard drive and a half height faceplate, a controller card, a 34-pin controller cable, a 20-pin data cable, mounting screws, a filler plate, and finally, a set of PC connection instructions. If you're missing anything that I've just mentioned, call us. You'll need some simple tools to do the installation. A Phillips head and straight blade screwdriver and nut driver set should do it. If you're going to remove one of your floppy drives, you'll also need something to adjust your dip switches. Most people just use a ballpoint pen. Before you open the cover of your PC, it's extremely important to rid your body of static electricity. A tiny amount of static electricity, even sparks that you can't feel, can damage the chips inside your computer. The best way to get rid of the static buildup on your body is to touch the computer frame while the power cord's still plugged in. If you go away to answer the phone or grab a snack, don't forget to get rid of the static charge again. Unplug any cables that may be attached to the back of your PC and move them out of your way so you'll have easy access to the computer. I'll use this PC that's already been disconnected. You'll have to remove these five screws to free up the cover. I've already taken mine out. Then turn the computer around and remove the cover by pulling it toward you. If the cover's stuck, give it a little tug. Be careful as you slide it forward. There's a tab on the inside cover that can catch on cables and pull them out or damage them. The tab will catch on the front of your PC, so lift up like this and take it completely off. If you've never seen the inside of your PC, now's a perfect time for a little tour. Underneath all this is the motherboard. For a better view, I've taken one out of another PC. The motherboard holds RAM and ROM chips and is the heart of your PC. Back here are the expansion slots where you can plug in internal memory boards, modems, or a disk controller card. When the motherboard is installed, like this one, the expansion slots are here. This is my video adapter card which translates the zeros and ones that the computer understands into letters and numbers that I can understand. This is a memory expansion card. And here's the floppy controller, which allows the PC to read and write data to its floppy disk, which are over here. And finally, this large silver box in the back is the power supply. Take a closer look at the power supply. There should be a tag which tells you if you've got a 63 and a half watt or 135 watt power supply. If you have the smaller one and you've already got several extras plugged in your PC, you may not be able to power up your computer once you've installed your new hard drive. 
If that happens, don't worry. You won't damage your computer or the new hard drive, but you'll have to make a decision to buy a larger power supply or disconnect one or more of the extras you've added to your system. The next thing you'll have to do is make room for the new hard drive. This won't be the same for all of you. If you've got two half-height drives stacked on top of one another, the job is pretty simple. All you have to do is remove the filler plate next to your floppies. But if you've got two full-height floppies, which look like this, you'll need to take one out. The mounting screws are on the side of your floppy, so there may be an expansion card or two in the way. You'll need to take them out first. Remove the bracket screws and pull the cards out of their slots. Then remove these two screws on the floppy. Some XTs and IBM clones have another screw on the bottom of the drive that has to be removed. Once all the screws are out, slide the floppy drive forward a little. Disconnect the controller and power cables. Then slide the floppy drive out. Put the floppy drive and the screws together in a safe place in case you ever want to put them into another PC or replace the remaining floppy should it fail. You'll have to change the settings on switch block one on the motherboard to let your PC know that you've removed one of the floppy drives. If you look closely, you can see that it's marked SW1. If you own an IBM PC, use a pen or a dip switch tool to change the settings so that switches 7 and 8 are on. Your switch block may look a little different, but the settings will be the same whether you have this rocker type switch or this slide type switch. If you own an XT or an IBM clone, take a look at your computer's guide to operations to see where to set your switches. They may be different than for an IBM PC. Remember, if you haven't removed a floppy drive, there's no need to change any of the switch settings. Let's get the controller card ready to install. Take a look at your card. It's got four connectors on it. This is the edge connector, and it's used to plug the card into the expansion slot on the motherboard. There's also a 34-pin controller connector labeled J1 and two 20-pin data cable connectors labeled J2 and J3. If you look real closely at the edge of each of the connectors, you'll see a tiny number one. That's to help you align the ribbon cables that will plug into the connectors. Both of the ribbon cables have a colored edge. Mine is red, yours might be blue. The colored edge just indicates pin one of the cable. Take the larger ribbon cable and line up the colored edge with pin one on the controller connector J1 and push it into place. Now do the same thing with the data cable. Line up the colored edge of the data cable with pin 1 of the data connector J2 and push it into place. Put your controller card and cables down for a minute so you can find an open expansion slot to plug it in. Now remove the knockout bracket by taking out this screw. You're ready to install the controller card, so line up the edge connector with the expansion slot and push it firmly into place. Make sure it's fully seated. Now you can use the screw you removed from the knockout bracket to fasten the controller card to the back of your PC. We're ready for the hard drive. If you don't find an error map with the printed material, there's probably a label attached to your hard drive. Copy the information down. You'll need it when we do the software installation, and you won't be able to read it when the cover's been reinstalled on your PC. I'll explain the error map when we get to the software section. Slide the hard drive partway into the opening so you leave room to connect the ribbon and power cables. If you take a look at the back, you'll see two edge connectors, and each one has a small slot. The slot indicates pin one of the connector. Take the large ribbon cable and line up its colored edge with pin one of the large connector push it into place. Line up the smaller ribbon cable in the same way and push it into place. Finally, find an unused power cable from the power supply unit and push it into place. It's keyed and it'll only go one way. 
If you're keeping two floppy drives, as well as a hard drive, and you can't find an unused power cable from the power supply unit, you're going to have to install a Y cable. Connect the base of the Y cable to one of the power supply cables coming out of the power supply unit. Then just plug your two floppies into the branches of the Y. You can now plug your hard drive into the remaining power supply cable. Hold the drive with one hand so that there are no gaps between the front face plate and the computer. Then tighten the installation screws. Only tighten them finger tight, or you might damage the hard disk drive. This is a good time to install the filler plate also. Now we're going to reinstall the expansion cards we removed earlier. Once again, make sure that it's lined up and seated firmly. Run the cables over the floppy controller. Make sure it's lined up and push it firmly into place. Then use the screws we removed earlier to fasten them in. and push the cables down close to the motherboard. It might be a little tight in there, but that's normal. Just make sure the cables are well out of the way. Now just make a quick check of your work. All the expansion cards and the controller card should be firmly seated in the expansion slots and should be screwed to the back of the computer's frame. The two ribbon cables colored edges should be aligned with pin one on the connectors and should be attached at the controller card and at the hard drive. Finally, check the power cable to the hard drive. Slide the cover back on. And reconnect the keyboard, monitor, and power cables. The hardware installation is complete, but I'd wait to reinstall the cover screws until we finish the software installation, which is coming up next. If you've got the 20 or 30 megabyte drive, your software instructions will immediately follow. If you've got the 40 megabyte drive, you'll have to fast forward through the next few minutes of tape until you see the section marked 40 megabyte software. The hard part's over, so let's get the software installed on your 20 or 30 megabyte drive. To save some time and confusion later, you should look at the directories of your DOS disks and note which disk has debug, which disk has fdisk, and which disk has format. Some versions of DOS call fdisk part. Depending on the version of DOS and the controller card you have, the installation might be slightly different. First, boot up DOS and at the A prompt, insert the disk with debug on it into the A drive. Type debug and return. When debug is loaded, your PC will respond with the debug prompt, which is a minus sign. Type G equals C 800 colon 5 and return. The computer will then tell you the version of the software that you have and ask you a series of questions. Look at the section called System Setup on your instruction sheet. Usually, you'll want the hard disk to be drive C, so press return. The next question asks if you want an air leave of three. That's what you want, so press return. When asked if you're dynamically configuring the drive, type N and return. Type Y and return to begin low-level formatting. This will take about four to eight minutes, depending on the size of the drive. When the low-level format is done, the PC will prompt with the message, do you want to format bad tracks? Type Y and return. The bad track map is printed on computer paper or on a label attached directly to the hard drive. You may remember I had you write these down earlier. 
Bad tracks are weak areas that have been detected at the factory. Locking them out now will save you big headaches later. Information written to these tracks won't be reliable. These bad tracks aren't uncommon and you don't have a defective drive. In fact, when you format your hard drive later, you'll see that it'll format to full capacity. It's just one of the ways the manufacturer makes sure that you'll have reliable information storage. You'll be prompted to enter the cylinder number and the corresponding head number. Look at the bad track or error map. Type the three-digit cylinder number, space, the head number, and return. A prompt will ask more, type Y, and return. Then respond to the cylinder and head numbers just like you did before. When you finish entering the entire bad track map, type N and return when you're prompted for more. Your PC will respond, format successful, system will now restart. Insert your DOS boot disk into drive A and push any key. Your PC will reboot DOS and prompt you with date and time questions. Answer as you normally do. Your PC will then display the version of DOS it's running and give you an A prompt. The next step is to partition the hard disk using the DOS utility F disk. Remember, a few versions of MS-DOS for IBM clones call it part instead of F disk. Type F disk or part and return. The PC then prompts you for more information. The program asks you to choose one of four options. Since this is a brand new disk drive, choose option one to create the DOS partition and press return. You'll be asked if you want to use the entire fixed disk for DOS. Answer Y and return. The program then asks you to insert a DOS diskette into the A drive. Press return. Your PC should then reboot, and when it does, the partition will be all set up. Respond to the time and date questions just as you always do. We're almost done. You'll have to format the hard disk before writing any information to it. Remember to format drive C and use the slash S option. This will copy all the system files to the hard disk and make it a bootable disk. So type format C colon slash S and return. A warning will appear. Since this is a new disk drive, there's no data to be lost. Type Y and return to proceed with the format. Formatting will take several minutes. When finished, the message Format Complete System Transferred will appear. You'll also see how many bytes of total disk space, how many were used by the system, and how many are available for you to use. If the DOS format was successful, you can reinstall the screws to the cover of your PC. Now you're ready to build subdirectories and create files on your hard drive. If you're unfamiliar with the advantages of using subdirectories, or you're not sure how to build them, consult your DOS manual. Remember to leave the door of your A floppy drive open when you first turn on your PC so that it will automatically boot the operating system from your new hard drive. When it boots, you'll see the C prompt instead of the old A prompt. That tells you that your new drive is ready to work. That's all there is to it. If you have any problems or questions, please refer to the troubleshooting guide or you can call us for additional help at 1-800-PCC-TECH. Remember, the next section is just for owners of a 40 megabyte drive. So if you just installed a 20 or 30 megabyte drive, you don't have to watch. This section contains the software installation instructions for those of you who purchased a 40 megabyte hard drive. You'll notice that the title on the screen says 40 megabyte software. 
If you purchased a 20 or 30 megabyte hard drive, just rewind the tape until you see the title change to 20, 30 megabyte software. That section contains the software installation instructions for your drive. After booting up your system, insert the disk manager disk into the A drive. You can type README and return it to A prompt. This will load an information file that you can scan through. It'll explain some of the options available and give you complete installation instructions. But I'll also take you step by step through the software installation procedures. At the A prompt, type DM and return. You'll be asked to respond to a series of questions. Answer like this. Type Y and return for one drive detected. Type 8 and return for model code. The screen will flash several pages, then ask if you want to lock out bad tracks. Type Y and return to enter bad tracks unless none show on the bad track map. If that should happen, and it isn't likely, enter N and go directly to step 9 of the written instructions. The bad track map is printed on computer paper or on a label attached directly to the hard drive. Bad tracks are weak areas that have been detected at the factory. Locking them out now will save you big headaches later. Information written to these tracks won't be reliable. These bad tracks aren't uncommon, and you don't have a defective drive. In fact, when you format your drive later, you'll see that it'll format to full capacity. It's just one of the ways the manufacturer makes sure that you'll have reliable information storage. The program will display the defect list management menu. Type A and return to add a track to the list. Then type the three digit cylinder number from the bad track map and return. Type the corresponding head number and return. Type Y and return to confirm that's the track and head that you want to add to the list. You'll be asked if you want to add more to the defect list. Type Y and return. Repeat this process, adding to the map the cylinder number and the corresponding head number until you've locked out all the cylinders you want. You can also correct a mistake by typing D to delete one from the lockout list. When you're finally done adding cylinders, type N and return when asked if you want to add to the defect list. Type W and return to write the defect map file. Type Y and return to confirm that this is the list. Type R in return to return to the initialization menu. Type Y in return to confirm map information. Now it's time to partition the drive. Most people will select the A option, which divides the drive into a very small bootable C drive for DOS, as well as a large 40 megabyte D drive for storage but you could choose option B or C if they're better suited to your needs. And if these standard options aren't right for you, you can always manually partition the drive. To do a manual partition, you'll have to go back and follow the instructions in the README file. If you chose one of the automated options, A, B, or C, type that letter and return. Then type Y and return to proceed with the installation process. That should take about seven minutes. Then the drive will proceed to verify that all the cylinders have been initialized, and that should take another seven to 10 minutes. When both the initialization and verification procedures are done, several screens will flash by. You'll be prompted to put your DOS disk into the A drive and then return. The system files will be copied onto the hard drive. You'll be prompted to put the disk manager disk in the A drive again and return. The verification process will continue up to cylinder 818 and you'll get a message that the installation process is complete. Once again, several screens will flash and then there will be an information page. Please read it. Then press return. Open your floppy drive to prepare your PC for rebooting. Press return. You'll see the version of Disk Manager as well as the date and time prompts. Answer them as you normally would. Your PC will then display the version of DOS it is running, 
and give you a C prompt, which is the prompt you'll get from now on if you remember to leave the door of your floppy open when you boot up your PC. Now you'll be ready to build subdirectories and create files on your hard drive. If you're unfamiliar with the advantages of using subdirectories or you're not sure how to build them, consult your DOS manual. If the installation has been successful, you can reinstall the screws to the cover of your PC. That's all there is to it. If you have any problems or questions, please refer to the troubleshooting guide or you can call us for additional help at 1-800-PCC-TECH.